A conversation after worship this past weekend got me thinking about a significant historical philosophical concept that has some important lessons for us today. Stay tuned. Hello, friends. Pastor Tim Westermeyer here, senior pastor of St. Philip the Deacon in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. Good to be with you as always. So um, I preached this past weekend, and on, I believe it was Saturday night's or after Saturday night's service, someone came up to me, and I had a line in, towards the end of the sermon, uh, which I will link to here if you want to listen to the whole thing, um, you know, saying something about, you know, this is why you were made. This is why you're here. Um, basically to, to share God's love with the hurting world, to be uh, a mirror of Christ's love for the world and so forth. And uh, someone came up to me after worship, who I know very well, and um, said sort of in jest, but also in earnest, uh, thank you very much for the sermon. I needed to hear that tonight, and now I know why I'm here. I mean, it was a nice compliment. And she was, again, uh, I think it reinforced for her that belief, right? And got, and she said, I'm going to sit with that and think about it for a while. That interaction got me thinking about something from this book, which I mentioned in a recent episode. Uh, we'll link to that episode as well. Uh, it was about what I'm reading right now. This particular book is um, uh, called Understanding the Hillbilly Thomist, The Philosophical Foundations of Flannery O'Connor's Narrative Art. It's a long um, title. And as I mentioned, I think in that episode about what I'm reading, uh, Flannery O'Connor, uh, brilliant, brilliant author, uh, short story writer, essayist, uh, died at the far too young age of 39 of lupus, but in my opinion and the opinion of many people was genuinely a genius. And uh, the point of this book is that she was a deep student of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, we've talked about him before. Um, one of the you know, towering, I would say, uh, intellects within the Western world in the last millennia uh, and maybe in the last two millennia, um, a Dominican uh, priest. And Again, the interaction with this um, individual on Saturday night about now I know why I'm here reminded me of a passage from this book that's lifting up uh, Flannery O'Connor's understanding of Thomas's use of what are called the four causes, which Thomas in turn picks up from Aristotle. I hope this is not too deep weeds. It's not all that complicated, um, but I'm going to drop a little philosophy on you today, and I hope you can follow me. Um, again, these are called the four causes, right? And they're, they're a sort of very famous um, way of explaining, I don't know, everything in the world. And I'll list them for you here, and I'll give a short explanation of what they mean in the context of a book, just to sort of make it clear, or I hope make it clear. And I'm quoting uh, now again from this book by uh, Father Damien Ferenc. The four causes are formal, material, efficient, and final. Okay, formal, material, efficient, and final. Uh, the formal cause is what a thing is, and the material call, cause deals with the matter that makes a thing what it is. For example, the formal cause of a copy of this book um, is, uh, is, is an artifact, it, or is book. It's a, it, the being in question is an artifact. The form is concerned with the essential aspect of the thing, the what it is as a whole. The material cause is composed of those visible elements that constitute wise blood, uh, or one of Flannery O'Connor's book, as it is. Paper, pages, ink, spine, front and back covers, etc. Okay. I, again, I realize this is slightly deep weeds, but trust me, I think it's relevant to our lives as Christians in the world today. So again, I've talked about formal and material. Formal is uh, what a thing is. Material is the, the material it's made out of. Um, the efficient cause answers, this is the third one, answers the question about what brings something into being. So in the case, again, of a book, the answer would be the author, the editor, the publishing house that printed the book, and so forth. And then the final cause, the fourth and final cause, answers the question about why a thing exists. That is its end, its goal, its purpose. And again, this author would say, as one example, the copy of a book by Flannery O'Connor exists primarily to be read and enjoyed by the one who reads it. Now, 
Aristotle and Thomas, I'm going to just read this next sentence, both think that in combination, these four causes provide a complete explanation of a thing, okay? Including human beings. Now, why is this important? It's important because since the Enlightenment, and particularly maybe since a philosopher like Descartes, um, again, I'll quote this author, the shift that incurs, occurs in modern philosophy keeps human beings from access to formal cause and final causes since Descartes, among other people, deemed um, them unimportant. Uh, so in other words, to know what a thing is and what a thing is for is beyond the scope of Descartes' mathematically based way of know knowing. So back to my sermon on, on Saturday. If I could translate that to sort of everyday language, what, what this author is saying is we no longer culturally ask, who am I and why do I exist? To put it in very simple terms, we're really good. And again, I celebrate the scientific method, but the scientific method by its nature is focused on uh, those middle cause, the material and efficient cause. What is something made of and how did it come to be here? So it takes out what you might call the metaphysical questions. Who am I and why am I here? And those are the deepest and the most important questions we can answer or ask in this lifetime. And when the whole culture around us tends to avoid them, I think it leaves us feeling empty. It leaves us feeling like we are simply these bodies who are made, yes, of course, of material things and chemicals and so forth, but that's not who we are and it's not what we were made for. I hope that makes sense. Again, I realize it's slightly deep waters of philosophy, which I'm not sure I'm explaining particularly well, but boy, I think this is so important. And if I might just in sort of conclusion here, quote a line from C.S. Lewis from his famous, famous Narnia Chronicles. This quote for me captures the spirit of everything I've just said about those four causes and the fact that we're avoiding uh, culturally, we tend to avoid who we are and what we're for. And it's in um, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And Eustace, one of the four heroes or heroines of that, of that uh, series of books, he's met now, and again, this is a sort of fantasy world, he's met uh, a star at rest, you know, the things you see in the sky, right? And Eustace, in meeting this star, the star's name is Ramandu, says, uh, he finds out that he's a star at rest. And he says, in our world, a star is a huge ball of flaming gas, okay? What is it made of? That's what that, that's answering the question, the, the material it's made of. And I love Ramandu's response. He says, oh, but even in your world, my son, that is not what a star is, but only what it is made of. Suggesting that perhaps our understanding of reality is far, far too limited and limiting. So I might leave you with this question, and maybe we'll pick it up in the next episode, but I'd encourage you to sit with it uh, for a bit. Who do you think you are, and why do you think you're here? And until we can pick it up next time, as always, be well, stay in touch, and God bless. Mm -hmm.